Hi, my name is Bill Rankin, um, and I work for an organization called Unful Learning, um, a, a consulting organization thinking about how learning works, and I also work for a company called PyTop, based out of London. You know, I think the critical purpose for education is um, to make people more human. I know that's going to sound weird, but I think we, we experience our fullest humanity as learners and as people um, growing and connecting with others. And that's always a complicated situation. I think we have to find ways um, to empathize and to understand people who are different to us. And that's, that's the fundamental goal, I think, of education. I think the most important thing for transforming education is um, going to be finding a way to move beyond just a concept of, of content, of stuff that we have to take into ourselves and learn. I think, I think we have to find a way to bring community back into learning and to think about the, the relationships that form um, in learning environments. And I think we have to think about the contexts as well, the, the spaces in which that learning happens. Um, physical spaces, but also cultural and social and historical spaces. One of the things we know is that the weakest ecosystems are those where there is the least diversity. So it's not that I want all education to be the same. I want us fundamentally, in fact, to bring the gifts of our own perspectives, our own regions, our own cultures, and, and to, to work on melding those together into something meaningful. That doesn't mean erasing those differences. In fact, it means um, talking about them and um, strengthening them by putting them with others. You know, I, I don't want to decry the importance of content. Content is a really critical dimension. It's just not the only dimension. I would certainly hate it if the person who's taking care of my airplane has not <laughs> learned enough to take care of the airplane and has not memorized some important skills. But I think the way we memorize is really important. Neuroscience tells us that memories that are just semantic, that are just informational and processed, don't stick with us very long and they don't stick very well. But things that we do, things that we make, um, when we apply that information in a meaningful way in making objects, that tends to situate that information a lot better. So it's not like I think it's Im irrelevant to memorize. I think it's important though how we memorize. And I would argue that we have to memorize more by making, by experiential learning, by putting that learning into real context and seeing how it works. Because then it, it carries with it the story of that information. I think that's very important for us. How change the Testing and assessment are a real challenge right now because they tend to be fairly hollow. It's hard for me to know what that mark actually means. Does it mean the person has mastery of that subject? Does it mean that they've just sort of lucked out on a test and answered the questions right when they didn't really know? Does it mean that maybe there's some bias in the test itself or maybe they got some help on the test? I, I don't really know what that means. And I think we're seeing a move generally away from testing. But what replaces it then, I think, has to be projects and the resources around those projects. Okay, so if I'm going to have you memorize this by making this object, then I have to see what that object is and I have to see how you got there, what your pathway was. And your pathway might be very different from the pathway of someone else in the same room or some other group in the same room. So being able to compare those pathways becomes really important. But what it means is that we fundamentally have to shift from this kind of testing that really gets rid of the human and turns people into a number and that instead we have to test in a way that really embraces the human and embraces the differences between us so that I recognize your particular process and that maybe there may be inefficiencies in it but that at least gives us a starting point and I can at least know what you actually know and what you don't know whereas the numbers of a test which seem objective actually just objectify the learners as well. I think this does require a, a difference in training teachers. I think our schools of education have often focused very much on classroom management 
and on data. And by data, I mean that kind of objective information that we get. So we're going to have to find a way to rehumanize the educational uh, process at our schools of education. But handily, easily, thankfully, most people already learn that way for most of their lives. So when your grandmother teaches you how to bake bread, or your grandfather teaches you how to fish, or your parents teach you how to do things around the house, there is no test, right? The test is, can you do that? Can you make that? Can you follow in the footsteps of your family? Can you follow in the footsteps of your friends and neighbors as they teach you skills? We know inherently how this works because it's the way all humans learn and the way we learn m most of our lives. So school is this kind of weird aberration. And I guess what I'm arguing for is that we need to return school so that it looks much more like the rest of the learning that we encounter. Fundamentally, I think I'm still trying to do what I was trying to do a decade ago when uh, at the university I worked at we gave all of our students iPhones because we were wanting them to break free from the confines of the classroom and, and take learning out into the real world. Um, and, and mostly I think in schools we've tried to keep the world out of the classroom, but I want to move the classroom out into the world. And I think that's still something that I, I want to do. It's been interesting because when I was at uh, the university and was teaching there, um, I had this profound sense of what was happening in my local community, but I didn't really understand the challenges globally that people face, and I didn't understand um, how similar those challenges are, but also their subtle differences. Um, so in some places, for example, it's not acceptable for teachers and, and learners to text one another. In other places it is. In some places, one tool is more popular than another tool. But I think what all of us are trying to do is find ways to connect more profoundly with our learners. The issue, I think, with technology is that we sometimes have imagined that that technology can carry us all the way on its own. And by, by seeing this kind of connection and making this network with people, I recognize more and more the human value of relationship and that that's really where we have to, I think, focus our attentions. So I used to teach this class um, in literary theory. It's a complicated class and um, you know, especially when we got to postmodernity, the current school of literary theory, which is this kind of big fragmented mess of stuff, um, students wanted more and more and more help. So I gave them more and more and more help. And the more I gave them, the more they needed. And the more they needed, the more I gave them. But it was this unsustainable situation where I was really, it was really about delivering information to them. And that meant that I was establishing this kind of power hierarchy, this dynamic where I had the information and they didn't. I was information rich and they were information poor. So at a certain point, I, I had a friend say, you know, you're doing all this crazy stuff with technology and you're out, and you're making all these things. How is that impacting your teaching? And I realized in this class it's not. So I should do something. So what I did was I talked to the students. We built a community. I asked them why they were there and what they wanted to learn. And then I asked them what things they should be in charge of and what things I should be in charge of. And what they decided I should be in charge of was just the schedule <laughs> and making sure things didn't go catastrophically bad. I was just supposed to kind of set some boundaries and that was it. So I had my students then design the course and what they designed was they would come in and they would read these complicated articles, but they wouldn't get my assistance. They would go try to find things on their own. And by searching the web, by f discovering this material on their own instead of asking for it from me, they were actually developing their own skills at finding. They were developing their own agency. And then, so they would go and look and find and bring stuff together and pool resources. So they were also building the community of the classroom. And then their job was to make something with all this stuff they had discovered. Instead of just thinking about it, which is what I was having them do, they actually built something with it. 
and the most fascinating thing happened because this course that had been really challenging and hard and students didn't succeed at all that well, all of a sudden students started doing amazingly at it and my undergraduates started outperforming the graduate students at my university. And it's because every day they knew that it was their responsibility to make something, that in making something they thought through what the information was, but they also thought through these mental models that helped them to situate it and carry it with them. And they moved from this kind of semantic memorization into learning by making. And when that happened, everything changed. You know, you, you would think that that kind of educational situation might result in some people rising and everyone else failing. But because it was functionally about community, every ship rose. And the students would make sure that if someone wasn't getting it, they would help them. And because the students were applying it in ways that made sense to them, something that I picked that made perfect sense to me but might not make sense to my learners, um, all of a sudden they could pick their own things. And so um, they weren't left behind because they were making it applicable in their own lives. And so what I found was actually that it was an overall better learning experience and fewer people were left behind in that structure. Well, it's been a great conference so far and it's been a real pleasure to have so many conversations with people from literally all over the world. Um, I think we had every continent represented uh, in the workshop I just finished and that's rare. And it's rare to have such a mix of um, administrators and teachers and scientists and influencers and people thinking broadly about education. So one of the things I think I've liked best about EduLearn is the diversity of uh, attendees and the way that that makes conversations so much richer. And I feel like it's been really rewarding.